Have you ever sat down to edit the details of your life and realize that you have layers? Layers of doubt, layers of laziness, layers of fear, layers that have completely covered our joy. God has given us divine access to every tool we need to change the picture of our lives. It's time to unmask every lie of the enemy. It's time to unmask every filter we use to cover ourselves. It's time to unmask this beautiful gift that God has given us. It's time to unmask our joy. Well, good morning, River of Life. It is great to be with you once again, and we are continuing our study on Unmasked. And this has been a great journey so far. We're going to dive into Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at a couple verses, but they are powerful, and these verses will be life-changing. I don't know if you ever heard of these two phrases. They're very familiar, though. And these phrases are going to really help us get an idea of what Paul is trying to um, talk about and what he's trying to let us realize. And then once we realize it, we are going to experience joy because the Bible tells us that joy is something that we already have and we have to expose it to the Holy Spirit to allow us to actually live in it and walk in it. But here are two sayings that I know you're familiar with. Number one is this. You have to hear the other side of the story, right? There's two sides to every story, and there's a reason for that. It it, it gives you a better picture of what you're dealing with. And then another phrase that we hear a lot is this. There's two sides to every coin right? There's two sides to every coin. And so what if we live just on one side of the coin or we only heard one side of the story? Seeing whatever perspective that is, there could be a big burden for all of us if that side of the coin was weighty. Because if it was, there is this this depth, this weight of the world that would be on our shoulders. And we can deal with that. There are a lot of things that we see or that we take on that we really don't have to do. And we're going to see that later on. You say, Dale, like what? Well, in the natural realm, it could be maybe a financial pressure, maybe a a, a, a mortgage food that 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 uh, we can't even get on the table week to week with our families because of financial burden it could be workloads it could be deadlines marriage issues guilt that we're trying to work through and we are looking for answers but all we hear in our mind is hey just work it out just do it. You can figure it out yourself. Dale, you got yourself into this mess. You can get yourself out. Or just grow up. Just grow up. Then to top it off, you open up the Bible wanting to get some direction, wanting to lift this burden, wanting to, wanting to live in joy because that's what we're talking about. And in Philippians 2.12, you... you you land your eyes on this and it says, therefore, church, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You're like, good, what is that all about? I mean, that's a little bit confusing. So when it comes to Christian growth, And if you remember, we talked about that last week, wanting to grow in Christ. How do we develop? I mean, do we do it by working on our relationship with the Lord by doing it ourselves? Or by letting go and allowing God to do in our lives what we cannot do for ourselves? So let's set up the equation this way. Is it faith in God? 
Or is it our effort that causes us to grow in Christ? That allows us to walk in joy. You see, there's two sides to the coin. There are two sides to every story. We have to hear them both. We have to see them both. Or else again, that weight, that burden of if it's all on us, I got to figure out my salvation. I got to do this myself. I got to work this out. And Paul solves the problem by looking at both sides. And that's what I love about this. So our effort plus God's touch. So there's the two sides equals living in joy. Now, I believe God is working in all of our lives. I know he is working in mine. And there is a strong desire to grow deeper in Christ this year. And, 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 and we have seen that. We have talked about it through so many different subject matters, prayer, and, and looking at Joseph's life for our purpose. I want to know my purpose. I want to fulfill my purpose. Uh, and, and now coming into joy and, and living in joy and taking off the masks and, and, and letting go of these filters. And, and we saw Drew's this morning, the filters that he is wanting to get rid of so he can what? Grow in Christ so he can live in joy. Listen, I want, and I think we all do, we want our life to count. We want our life to count. I want to take off the filters in my life. I want to get rid of these masks once and for all. So let's see what Paul says because he's he's letting us know if we see both sides and we understand both sides, then we are going to live in the joy that God called us to. So the first side of the coin is this. Our effort will bring excitement to our life. Our effort will bring excitement to our mission. If we are going to know Christ more, there are some things we need to understand to encourage that process. And Paul gives us three of those. And I just want to, I just want to break those down for you using three words. The first word is example. Example. What's our example to be? Well, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, therefore. And you know if you've come to River of Life for any length of time, when you're reading that and you're studying and you're trying to gain knowledge in the word of God, you have to ask yourself, okay, what is it there for? And in this particular instance, It signals a conclusion to what Paul writes, and we talked about this last week in Philippians 1, 5 through 11. He says, because of your partnership in the gospel from this first day until now, I am sure of this, that he who begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of God and the praise of God. So what is he saying here? Christ is our example to live in joy, not happiness. Happiness comes and goes. It's not constant. Joy is something that regardless of the situation, this is a spiritual fruit that is already in us at salvation. So Christ is the example. Therefore, Paul says, since you have that example in Christ, since you now know what a Christian is supposed to be, walk in it, live in it. Act like it. Therefore, this is what we need to do, he's saying. Christian growth begins with an understanding who Jesus is and how he lived. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 says, For this you have been called. Why? Because Christ also suffered for you. Watch this. Leaving you, leaving us an example so that we might follow in his footsteps. Working out our salvation Being involved means understanding what we are working on. 
we said this before, but it's true, especially today, we need to bring back those bracelets, what would Jesus do? Asking ourselves, what would he do? How would he respond? How would we act? And once we get that answer through the word of God, do that. Why? Because he is our example. Jesus was how he lived. He was the same person behind the scenes and out in front. And that's what we're called to do. Well, the second word is responsibility. What is our responsibility? He says this in in verse 12, chapter 2 of Philippians. Church, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You say, Dale, what does that really mean? Well, some say that means to work for your salvation. Others say it means to work at your salvation. But salvation is not by works. You and I can't earn a place in heaven. We can't work our way towards something that God has given us for free. Now, he died for our sins, but but we can't just work a spot out in heaven for us by what we do. In fact, Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace we have been saved, and this is not by our own doing. There it is right there. It's not by our own doing. It is a gift from God. In other words, salvation comes by faith alone. So it can't mean that we are to work on trying to be saved. So Paul's saying you are to work out, right? That uses that word. Work out your salvation. Work out is used in the secular literature in the Greek language of mining. So it is, the picture is like going into a mountain and you know that mountain has values in it. Valuable treasure, let's say gold or diamonds. And so you're working, you're pressing in to pull something out of that mountain. Okay, something of value. In other words, at salvation, God takes up residence in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. He says in Romans 8, 9, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. In other words, if we don't have the Spirit of Christ living in us, that means we have not accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. And I want you to pay attention to this this morning because at the end of this message, you have a chance to give your life to the Lord. After you have seen both sides of the coin, after you've heard both sides of the story and understand what it's all about, you get a choice. I get a choice. Now, the struggle for us is to, take, is to take what is inside of us and let it come to life on the outside so people can see it, so people can testify to the fact that, man, there is something different about Dale Donatio. There is something different about Drew Evans. Whatever is in him, I want it. And that's why these filters, these masks, have to be dissolved and taken off once and for all. Because if we don't deal with it, that's what comes out. So that takes a great deal of effort, as you know, to walk in joy, to walk in unity, to walk in in patience and kindness and goodness, all the fruits of the Spirit, uh, self-control. It it, it takes a lot to serve, to forgive others, to love like Christ loved. It, It takes a lot to be a generous giver, to know what giving is all about, to obey the Word of God when it comes to tithing, where, where it comes to, to giving something of value that, that we hold dear. And a lot of times, it is money. And Paul says, if you are now a new person on the inside, hey, be a new person on the outside. Be authentic. Be real. Drop your guard. Trust in the Spirit. You say, well, Dale, how do I do that? 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 25, it tells us what to do. He says every athlete, and, and what a great analogy, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. In other words, a, a perishable reward, whether it's a gold medal, even if it's money, doesn't last forever. He says, but we are and but we an imperishable reward. So so this this word training is gumno, it, it means gymnasium, and and it, it carries this concept of again working out. You're, 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 you're training for something. You don't win the Olympics. And we're, 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 if you're watching, Ange and I are big Olympic fans. And we are watching all the pre-qualifying matches. And we're getting pumped for the Olympics this year. But, but you don't win the Olympics by just hanging around. You, you don't win the Olympics by going into it half-hearted. I mean, we, we win by going into strict training, by taking it seriously. So what does it take then for, for Christian maturity? What does it take for you and I to grow in joy, to live in joy? It takes discipline. It, and we may not want to hear that, but it's just the, it's the truth. It takes discipline. It takes dedication. It takes heart. It takes passion. There has to be a priority in our life. You see, the fact of the matter is, we always want God to deliver us, but we don't want the discipline. Listen, it takes discipline. It takes effort if we are going to develop, if we are going to mature, if we're going to grow in Christ. And so he says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, every athlete exercise self-control in all things. They do it to get something that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. There is a race of, of, of much greater importance that we are living out, that we are running towards, and it is eternity. It is heaven, and it matters. It matters how we prepare ourselves for that final goal it matters how we live our life each day it matters what our attitude is so he says in verse 26 so i do not run aimlessly because of that i do not live my life aimlessly i am not going to settle for happiness because because happiness is less than joy. I am going to go for joy. Because joy is full of his glory. The joy of the Lord brings strength. It is going to give me a different perspective of life. And I don't want to live my life based on how I feel. Because when I feel bad, I'm not, I'm not going to be happy. When I don't get what I want, I'm not going to be happy. When, all these things will be up and down and I'll live a roller coaster life and I don't want that. I want to live in joy because again, joy is constant. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. L least after Paul says preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He said, listen, I'm dealing with these masks as well. I'm dealing with these layers, these filters. And listen, I'm preaching to you, but I'm preaching to myself, Paul says. And I'm telling you that too. Every Sunday, I'm, I'm not just preaching to you or at you. No, we're in this together. I'm preaching about my own life. I want these things for my life. And I know it's hard. And I know it's a struggle. And, 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 it's, and it's hard to do, but we, we must do this because God does want the best for us. He does want us to live in joy. So Paul says again in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the fight. Watch this. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In Ephesians 6, 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We have to be aware of this. But against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Church, our walk with Christ demands maximum attention. Maximum attention. We will see positive changes in our life when we realize our effort plus God's touch equals joy. 
when we realize we shouldn't be going after happiness, we should be going after joy. That's where our effort needs to, to lie. So how is it that Paul, just one man, could accomplish all that he did in his life? All the churches that he started, all the people that he healed through the power of Jesus Christ because of his faith, because of his boldness proclaiming the word of God, was able to write a third of the New Testament. Everything that he did with all of his deficiencies in life that he had, he rose above and he fought for the prize. He went into strict training. How did he do so much? I think of my mom and dad. My mom's from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. My dad's from New York. And, and they get married. They go to Toke, Alaska with no running water, with an outhouse where it's 60 below zero to go to the bathroom. And they, they build a church and then they built four more and everything they did for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I look back, I didn't appreciate it before. And I see, I said, how did they do it? All the struggles, all the hardship, how did they do it? How did Billy Graham live a life of, 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 on that caliber, on that level for so long? All the presidents that he, that he ministered to, all the nations, all the preaching. How did he do it with all that he, that, that, that he has gone through? And we can, we can mention so many different people who have gone through tragedies in life but didn't give up on God and continue to make an impact in their families, in the world, in their communities. How do they do it? Because they gave their best all the time. And that's what Jesus said. Hey, seek first my kingdom. Seek first me. Listen, God's work in us is to mine out the best in us. It takes maximum effort, and we live in a day that thinks only maximum comfort. A minimalist philosophy whereby we do what we want to do when we want to do it, and certainly never ever if we don't feel like doing it. Listen, we will see life-changing results when we realize our effort plus God's touch equals joy. We must work out our salvation. Well, the third thing is commitment. Third word. Our salvation has a lot riding on it. And I don't think we really see this side of the coin. We don't pay attention to this side of the story very much. And I, and I, got, I have to say it again. Our salvation has a lot riding on it. So Paul says, therefore, church, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, watch this, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear is phobos in the Greek, and we get our word phobia from it. And then the word trembling is traumas. And, and in other words, as you work this out, understand just how serious, how important this is. So we have to get fired up about our lives and what we can do for Jesus Christ since the Spirit of God lives in us. We have to be all in. We have to have wholehearted teamwork, not just as a church or a family, but also individually as Christians across the world doing what God calls us to do, working out our salvation in fear and trembling. Let's not let our Christianity be a, 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 another add-on to our lives it has to be our lives we do it with fear and trembling our attitudes our prayer life care working on our character being like jesus but because of lack of because lack of commitment means lack of growth and remember we we, we have to keep that equation in our mind, our effort plus God's touch. There's two sides of the coin, two sides to every story. We're focusing on just one right now, but we have to get that side of the story. 
We have to understand that side of the story. We have to know every detail about that coin that we're looking at. And, we're, and we're, if we're looking at the head side of the coin, we got to study it. We got we to gotta understand it because, because, it's, because our effort plus God's touch is going to equal joy in our life. You say, Dale, you're, you need to take a chill pill. Because you're getting all hyper, your voice is raising, cracking and all that. You're taking this way too seriously, man. Taking this way too seriously. And let me say this. I'm taking it seriously because God desires us to be the best version we can be. We don't, I mean, so many Christians settle for mediocrity. They never hit their potential. They, they never understand this side of the story. And, 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 and. We do not become the best version of ourselves for our, for our spouse, for our friends, for our children, for our coworkers, for our employer, for, for him, most of all, for Christ. Listen, let's not lose that awe and respect for the fear of the Lord. And so when it says fear, we're not saying live in fear of him. It's this respect. It's wanting to do all we can, wanting to be the best for him. I remember with my parents, I wanted to be the best I could be for my dad. I wanted my dad to be so proud of me. I wanted my mom to be so proud of who I was as a, as a, as a, as a man. And, and this is what we're saying here. This is what Paul is saying. We, we realize that Jesus with God loves us. He has compassion for us. And church, I'm all for fun and finding new ways to promote the gospel. But in all the hype of packing the gospel up for entertainment value, I fear we are doing what the author, one author said. We are amusing ourselves to death as Christians. We're living in mediocrity. And, and, and listen, the Lord wants us to live a life to the fullest and that's why it says in John 10.10, 10, the thief, the enemy, the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy. But on the other side, I came that he may and you may have life and have it abundantly. That's what he wants for us. And that's how we must live our life to the fullest. And when we do that, that means we work out our salvation. All right, that's, that's one side of the story. That's one side of the coin. And it does seem overwhelming. But like I said, we got we to listen to the other side. We got to see the other side. And the other side is this. His touch eases life's tensions. Jesus' touch eases life's tension. On the flip side of the coin, you give it all you have, and God gives it all he has. You don't have to give up, especially if you're here today and you feel your faith is all up to you. Because the reality is, it's not. The beautiful thing about Christianity is, God sets the standard, and yes, we saw it's high and calls us to walk that standard, but then God says, okay, Dale, now that you understand this side of the story, you see this side of the coin, you understand the standard, I'm going to help you get there, and I'm God, right? I'm God, and you're not. And so in 2 Peter 1.3, watch this, his divine power okay not just not just power not man's power his divine power has granted to us that means you and i all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence some things we need to understand about god in us we have to get this side of the story the first is this, we don't have to worry because of God's power. In Philippians 2.13 it says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The emphasis in those verses is God. Who is God? He is the creator of all the universe. And God, who is powerful enough to think a thought and it just becomes a reality. That God. That divine power. Wow. That, it's amazing. 
That is the God we serve, and he is at work in you. He is at work in me. So when Drew looks at these, these, uh, these filters that he has to get rid of, that he's battling, that he has to tackle, he has to remember that, that there is a God of the universe who created the universe, who spoke it into existence, and he is on his side. He is on my side. He is on your side. He is at work in us. And Romans 8 gives us an incredible insight how God is working in us. Look at it. In verse 26, he says, The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for us according to the will of God. That's good. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those who he called, he justified. And those who he justified, he glorified. And look what verse 34 says of the same chapter. Who is to condemn then? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that was raised from the dead. Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed, that means fact, intercedes for us. So, here we go. You have, I have, the Spirit of God praying for us. You have the Son of God praying for you. You have the Spirit of God living in you. You have God the Father justifying you. It doesn't get better than that. That is amazing. He is working on your behalf, on my behalf. Verse 13, Philippians 2. For it is God who works. It's God who works. It's God who works in you, in me. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In fact, that word works is energeo, and we get our word energy from it. You know, we, you see on the commercials the, the energizing bunny, and if he has a certain battery in him, the energizer bunny does not wear out. Well, God, he has nothing on God here. And that's why this word energy, you can translate it this way. It is God who is the energizer. It's God who is the energizer. How can Paul tell us to give it all we have? Because we have a God who he is energizing us to do what he has called us to accomplish. What he has put in our hearts. What he has purposed for us on this earth to do. He is, his desire is to move us toward living a powerful life. Living a joyful life. Recognizing that happiness is a second tier. It is not a first tier. It is a lesser then joy. Joy is what we need to go after. Joy is what we need to, we need to discipline our minds to, to uh, have a, a, a desire and a will to say, you know what, this is what I want. This is going to get me closer to the Lord. Why? Well, Ephesians 3, uh, 16 says that according to his riches of his glory, he may grant to you strength and power through his spirit in your inner being. That's why we go after it. Philippians, excuse me, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you, watch this, with all joy. Why? Because the peace in believing so that by the power of oh, the, the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. It transforms us. It changes us. Why? Because when we grasp this mindset, we can say like Paul in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because it's the joy of the Lord that is my strength. I have transformed my thinking. I have set aside happiness for joy and it's going to make all the difference in the world because I'm understanding the both sides of the story. I'm seeing both sides of the coin and it is transforming my life. It's going to transform your life. 
And I know we're talking a very high level of responsibility on our part, but we don't have to do it on our own. That's the good news. He gives us the strength. He gives us the power, which in return helps us to be rooted. It helps us grow deeper in him. And, and, and when that happens, then we are more than conquerors because we are in him. When that happens, we can take on certain roller coasters or certain trials that are going to come into our lives. The Bible says, listen, we will go through them, but he will help us through them all. We will face strong temptations in life, but there is not a temptation that he is not going to give us, the Bible says, a way of escape. And, 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 and when we rely on him, he gives us the out. Well, the second thing, we don't have to worry because he has a plan. In Philippians um, chapter 2 and, and, and verse 13, um, he, he lets us know that God wants to encourage us, it says, to, to will and to work. So he wants to give us a desire, and he wants to help us then meet that desire. That's what it's talking about. He does it in a couple ways. He gives us a holy discontent. He, 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 he makes you and I discontent with the level of our spiritual commitment. When we're going after God, we want more. And then when we go after that, we want more than that. We're growing in our relationship. We're, 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 we're overcoming spiritual weaknesses. And that encourages us. We are seeing those, those uh, layers, if you will, those masks come off. And that excites us. That's, that lets us know, hey, I'm working hard. God's working for me on my behalf. We're conquering. We're moving forward. This is exciting. I mean, do you realize that a part of the work of God is to make you and I sick of being a sinner? That's, that's part of it. I mean, he knows to move you and I from, from A to B. He has to show us who we really are. You remember last week when Paul says, I am the worst of sinners. He, he knew who he was, but he also knew what God was doing in him and through him. And so he began to realize, hey, God's grace is sufficient. I can do more through him. I am more than a conqueror. Why? Because I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm seeing both sides of the story. I'm understanding this now. The good news is he doesn't stop there. He begins to make you and I long to be better. How? By reading the word, by prayer, by listening to maybe a message and it touches your heart. And, and you get out of these four walls. You stop listening. You, you stop as uh, you turn off the, the TV or your phone. And those words that you heard in that sermon begin to do something in you. And you, are, you, are, you, you, you want to grow. You want to get better. And what is happening is, is that's not just your thoughts. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you to God. Because you're hearing truth and we were created, whether you're an atheist watching today or an agnostic, it doesn't really matter. The fact is, whether you believe it right now or not, you were created in God's image. So what you're feeling is God, the Holy Spirit, drawing you to the Father, drawing you to truth, waking you up to who you really are, both to will and to act. That's what Paul's saying. So, we see that in Philippians 3.12 where he says, not that I have already obtained this or I'm made perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Why? Because Jesus Christ has made me his own. And what is God's heart? Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. This is Paul, excuse me, Paul's heart. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul says, the more I know about him, the, the more I want to know. And the more I know that, I want to know more. And I want to know more. And I want to know more. He says, that is my goal. Philippians 3, 14 and 13 says, I'm going to forget now what lies behind me. And I'm going to strain forward to what lies ahead. 
and he gets pumped up, he gets charged up, he says, I, I press on towards the goal for the prize upward for the call of God of Jesus Christ in my life. This is a man who is consumed to know God. And it is God who is working in his life. And God is no respecter of persons. He's working in my life. He's working in Drew's life. He's working in your life. And the more Paul yields to Christ, guess what? The more Christ works in him. Listen, if if we crave that spiritual desire, God will propel us in that direction and give us the ability to act. Understanding his pleasure When that happens, we then accept and benefit from the blessings of God. Let me read you verse 13 in the NASB version. It says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work, watch this, for his good pleasure. Why is God working in you? Why is God working in me? So that we can bring him pleasure. We say a lot here in in River of Life that, word selah in the old testament in the hebrew and when you read something amazing you just have to stop and think about that i mean god is at work in you the bible says so that you can bring him pleasure what a incredible statement that is that we can bring god pleasure I mean, we are talking about the God of the universe who can do anything he wants. And whenever he does anything, he does it perfectly. Yet Paul says, when God works in my life, he does it in a way that, that an imperfect person like me. You remember Paul said, I'm the worst of sinner, sinners. A person like me can, can please a perfect God. That's incredible. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, how, so how do we come, become men and women of God? How do we grow in Christ? How do we experience joy? How do we live in it? We work out our salvation. And now you've heard both sides of the story. Or as Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. Second, we give it maximum effort. And at the same time, God works in us. It takes all of him and all of us. It takes everything you are and everything he is. And you know what the result is? Your life and my life is transformed. Our mindset is fixed on joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. What is God wanting to do in you to form you into the person that he can work through? That's what we have to ask ourselves. And listen, what relationship is he wanting you today to make right? What ministry is he wanting you to be involved in? How are you to serve him? How are you to serve his church? How are you to serve his community, his world? Because it is his. What wrongs does he want you to make right today? I mean, what is he putting in your heart to overcome? What addiction? What temptation? What is he showing you? Listen, you have to put forth the effort, but he's going to be right there with you, matching it and going above and beyond what you and I can think or imagine. You know, something, maybe you're listening this morning and you say, Dale, there's something different here that I have ever experienced before, I, that I've ever heard before. And, and you're talking about all that God does. You're acting like he's actually a friend. You know what? He is. The Bible says he's a friend. He sticks closer than a brother. And you say, I've never seen God in a positive light like you're talking about. I've always thought he was harsh. I always thought he would have wanted to crush me if I did something wrong. I, I haven't heard this side of the story. Listen, I want to ask you this. Have you ever come to a place in your life where you have surrendered control of your life to Jesus? Because that's what not just I'm asking you to do, that's what he's asking you to do in his word. And he says, you know what? If you do that, I am going to set you free 
I'm going to change your life. I am going to, I'm going to create in you something that is new. The Bible says it's a new creation, a new person. He transforms us. And he's going to help us through that process of getting to that point where we are more like him. But the first thing we have to do is accept him as Savior. And if you are here this morning and you want to accept Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do so. The Bible says that we must believe. We believe that he is God. That he came to this earth. He, he, he was born through a virgin. Her name was Mary. He walked this earth. He died. He rose again. And we can have life everlasting through him. And if, if you want to make that decision, or if you want to talk about it, I want you to go to our website, and, 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 and we, want to, we want to talk with you. We want, to, we want to guide you. We want to help you. We want to rejoice with you if you've given your life to Jesus today. And then same with prayer. Listen, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to work out our salvation. It's hard to remember God is working just as hard and helping us and if you need prayer we want you to go to our website as well and listen we pray for those requests every single day we get them to people that pray non-stop 24 7 praying that that God opens who he is to you the Bible says pray for one another bear one of those burdens and we want to do that listen you can join us on, on Wednesday night for the Word. We are in a study of Revelation. That is at 7 o'clock. Or we will see you again next Sunday, 10 o'clock. God bless you. We love you so much.